Uh, yeah, you are. Do you want me to move it so you're not? Uh, you sure? <laughs> no. The unfortunate accidents of Fukushima and Chernobyl still unfortunately haunt the recesses of individuals. But this was not the truth. This was not the empirical revealed reality of how nuclear power plants work. They were a million times more effective than coal. We think that we should use nuclear power. Three points of setup. Firstly, what was the environmental movement? Obviously, significantly decentralized, but three specific factors. Firstly, organizations and corporations like Greenpeace and Climate 200. Secondly, high profile influencers like Greta Thunberg. And thirdly, the average individual who opts into the climate change movement and cares about climate change. Secondly, we would know that you require a cohesive narrative and ability to opt into these narratives in order to get any delta of change on the both sides of the house. But relatively powerful incapacity is the environmental movement. Look at the revealed and empirical ability for these movements to impact change, stuff like that. Secondly, in terms of setup, what did heavy privatization and advocacy look like? I would note in the status quo that individuals in corporate corporation actions did and empirically has been effective. We would note two things on top of this. Firstly, public messaging through social media campaigns and influences and rallies and stuff like that. Secondly, we would look at the active lobbying of nuclear policies through government and infrastructure, but on top of that, corporations and investment and research for like nuclear corporations and stuff like that. Thirdly, individuals to engage and interact with this. And I'll note here also, you shouldn't, uh, this isn't, the delta of this debate isn't like telling individuals not to buy solar panels because you can't buy your own nuclear production facility so this like mitigates against negative saying that we have an opportunity cost incurred where, where people don't invest in like small scale uh just, like safe and green energy third and final thing is like the state of nuclear energy in the status quo we would say two things firstly there's probably an irrational public fear as i messaged to you in that introduction which is to say there's significant amount of non-environmental lobbying against this for example the recent shutdown of the nuclear power plant in new york the second thing we would point out is the rollback and the nature of this rollback is a fewfold firstly that existing plants are being roll back in terms of their capacity, in terms of how much nuclear energy they are able to produce, as well as the research and general uh, investment in infrastructure that is putting into these things. Secondly, the nature of this rollback is that the counterfactual that they are rolling back to is predominantly fossil fuels, just because of how narratives are functioning in the status quo. And we would say that this prevents the further, like, I guess, investment and expansion, and that is the imperative that the side negative needs to defend against. For example, we would say that we have nuclear energy recycling plants that exist in the status quo and are significantly effective, but fundamentally because there is insufficient public capacity to engage with these things, these things are not used to the fullest potential. We would say that nuclear power works. We will not wait for carbon capture and solar panels to reach the tipping point of where they are effective. The thing works right now. We have the imperative to stop Pakistan from going underwater. We win this debate. And the final thing I want to note is that this is probably the imperative. There is just a rapid like, imperative that we need to do. This is probably the thing that is most useful in the short term. Two arguments. First, why this is the best push to go for as an environmentalist movement. Secondly, about our public like, palatability and stuff like that. Three points of characterization. Firstly, we would say that there is powerful but insufficient capital in the status quo in so far as we're able to maximize the utility and influence of this insofar as we have a lot of capital but it isn't concentrated in the status quo because we're focusing on other alternatives. Because this is heavy prioritization of this message, we can reconvene all of those capital uh, that the environmentalist movement has into uh, all of these things. Secondly, we just said that infrastructure and research just exists in the status quo and is significantly invested in by countries like the US, like France, like Germany, like Australia, like Japan, like South Korea, or significantly use like you know uh, nuclear energy to some extent within their grids, we can maximize and increase that percentage and stuff like that. And we probably just facilitate, you know, expanding mines and things as like tertiary and like run, run down benefits there. Third point of characterization is important in terms of like other forms being already supported and stuff like that. So, for example, things like solar and water probably has a significant, uh, like, you know, palatability mechanism in the status quo, as in most people already like engage with solar panels and think that they're good. And the 
predominant people who are pushing back against this are probably climate conservatives, which means that the delta on side negatives counterfactual is relatively small. Cool, let's go into some mechanisms. I'm gonna prove this in three ways. Firstly, just to explain why this is the fastest way to approach decarbonization. Secondly, why this is the most palatable. Thirdly, why this is the easiest way to integrate. Firstly, on decarbonization. Nuclear power plants can work 24 seven. They have variable output. You're not reliant on environmental that environmental factors like uh, you know solar panels and stuff like that. Secondly, we will explain to you that the existing infrastructure for you know nuclear power plants to be you know uh, involved in the infrastructure and the you know the structure of how energy works already exists in terms of grids and stuff like that. Secondly, the processes of how nuclear energy and how nuclear research like you know works is significantly well established in the status quo. Maybe because of like you know the use of it as weaponization, but also just like you know nuclear energy is pretty uh, long history and so, uh, stuff like that. Thirdly, we'll explain to you that it is incredibly cheap for I think six reasons. First, nuclear deposits and stuff like that are extremely common. Secondly, there are vast alternatives to nuclear sources, i.e. plutonium, like plutonium, any you know radioactive source kind of works. Thirdly, we'll explain to you that there are multiple sources where nuclear power plants can be filled from. Uh, the counterfactual is stuff like lithium, which is far more rare than you know, nuclear deposits. Fifthly, we'll explain to you, you don't actually need that much uranium or plutonium in order to you know, power a plant for you know, decades. Uh, fourthly, and fi uh, sorry, fifthly and finally, you have the ability to recycle this energy, which is something that doesn't exist on their side. The fourth mechanism for this is just is such significant density in these nuclear cores and this nuclear energy that it probably just outweighs the counterfactual that size negative is able to promote. Second reason in terms of palatability, a few things. Firstly, this sidesteps all of the conservative outrage in terms of like stuff about storage. The people that the reason that people have problems with hydroelectricity and solar panels and wind farms is because they're not reliable, because they never actually work and they lead to power outages in South of, uh, South Australia and France and stuff like that. To use nuclear power plants, this, these problems fundamentally just do not intrinsically exist within these things. So that means they're going to be on board and you're going to get like less pushback from the conservatives on the side affirmative, but you just facilitate broad expansion in terms of narratives and stuff like that. But on top of this, we probably create jobs, the government incentives probably align, that means we're more able to do these things. Finally, on integration, there are a set of corporate actors who massively benefit from the utilization of nuclear energy being folded into infrastructure, which means at the point at which you're able to call up these narratives as the environmentalist movement and use these in your lobbying efforts and messaging efforts, that means you're able to, you know, uh, I guess, get that capital and use it and stuff like that. Cool. What are the impacts? Threefold. Firstly, you're just far more efficient in terms of changing, uh, preventing climate change and utilizing energy and stuff like that. This obviously aligns with the principal fulfillment of climate change movement, but also just means that you're far more like, empirically and pragmatically effective in terms of preventing climate change. Secondly, there are, like, even if side of negative is able to maximally mitigate against the effectiveness of nuclear uptake, we would say that the degree to which nuclear energy is effective just is significantly like, outweighing that. So even if they reduce 100% to 10%, the like, nature of how nuclear energy is effective and the density of it probably still outweighs their counterfactual. Thirdly, this probably revitalizes the movement like, in, in, internally because counterfactual movements for like social, uh, solar panels and wind farms have been ineffective. This revitalizes, causes a set of self-reciprocating feedback loops in terms of like internal buy-in and stuff like that. Second argument about public opinion. Firstly, we know that we get unique buy-in. This probably is a benefit multiplier at the point which you believe our first argument, but three points of characterization on top of this. Firstly, this is relatively trustworthy in so far as the climate change movement already has a significant amount of capital in the eye of public opinion. Secondly, there is probably a pre-existing uh, point of examples where they have been successful in terms of like plastic bag and stuff like that. But they also have res like revealed structural reasons for why this is the case because they have a significant access and unique access to knowledge and you know uh, influences and stuff like that. Because like the only way they're able to actually change people's mind is through the things that they've already been doing. We so that just means they're probably effective. Thirdly and finally, uh, the need of public opinion is just a prerequisite that they need to change on side negative. Cool, let's slow down and go through some mechanisms. Firstly, in terms of education, we will know that in the status quo, the primary aversion to nuclear power energy is fundamentally irrational, fundamentally emotional, and not necessarily based on logical like capacity and stuff like that, which means that the movement is uniquely suited and well-placed to push back against those uh, like emotional and ideological narratives to change perceptions and change you know public uh, stuff like that. Secondly, in terms of public buy-in, we would just uh, explain to you, they have been able to change public incentives, they probably will be on the outside. Thirdly and finally, we just facilitate broad you know, dissemination, there probably is a ripple effect at the point at which you have a like, relatively small aversion to nuclear energy, at the point at which you're able to change one thing, probably change everything. This just means you're able to optimize reality, you're able to introduce nuclear energy into our existing infrastructure. That means you're able to stop climate change. It means you're able to get far more efficient you know, energy. You stop coal power plants. So proud to affirm. <laughs> Thank you.
why out of all the forms of renewable energy right now, the demand for nuclear energy uniquely is actually going down in a lot of countries. You can see Germany trying to get rid of all power plants by the year 2030 as a plan that now is actually in light of Fukushima's incident, right? Whether it's safety, long-term sustainability issues regarding wastage, whether it's the sensitivity around issues of nuclear proliferation and technology, these are all reasons why the status quo, we are, are actually moving towards a world of renewable energy that's not nuclear energy. Four things I'm, I'm going to talk about in this speech. Firstly, why the current context is one, where this is going to come at the expense of current capital and momentum that the environmental movement has for renewable energy. Secondly, why this is going to mean actually very unproductive discourse for the environmental movement, the, for, for the environmental movement at large. Thirdly, why it's going to be bad for sustainability overall, and why on our side, uniquely, uh, fourthly, we can actually do you know, renewable energy properly. So firstly, then, on what this hippie prioritization is going to look like. I agree that they're probably going to try and make it as safe as possible, the, but the problem with this is that in order to convince the public of its safety, because for so long nuclear power has been stigmatized to a large degree, it's going to, the explanations are likely going to be very technical, detailed, and not actually be nuanced in a way where the average public person can't understand, right? Whether it's your like uh, stats, videos, empirical evidence, these are all things that cut against the very visceral impact of things like Chernobyl and Fukushima. I think this will therefore come at the expense of advocacy for things uh, for, uh, for things to the public, whether it's renewable energy like solar, hydroelectric, uh, wind power, these are all things that we want to support the advocacy for on our side of the house, right? Why is this case? Because right, why is this crucial? Because right now the momentum and advocacy that exists for renewable energy, people are slightly ambivalent, maybe don't know enough uh, enough right now to think that it's actually going to be a long-term, like very sustainable thing across the world. I think that's why we need to get on this right now, and this hurts the capital to do that on their side of the house. The way in which, therefore, I think you position yourself or present yourself um, to investment, right, whether it's investment bankers, venture, cap uh, venture capitalists, when you're like going through lobbying and negotiation processes to actually work for, um, uh, work for, work towards nuclear energy delivery, uh, nuclear energy plants. I think the um, if, if, if you're trying to look environmental, that means you're likely to shift your calculus, right, um, towards good public approval. Also, the move, uh, also because you want the movement's um, approval at the plant, which uh, nuclear energy becomes the main thing that's currently um, the renewable source of energy for the world, right? I think the problem with their side, therefore, is that because all those conversations and negotiations are now having to discuss nuclear energy as opposed to these other things, they uniquely do take away capital and impetus from discussing renewable energy, pushing and lobbying and negotiating for renewable energy sources as a venture capitalist, and investment bank, etc. I think that's where all discussion is going to be headed. Therefore, it does uniquely come at the expense of all these other alternatives that are good and outside the house. The second thing I'm going to talk about then, on why actually right now the environmental movement has the capital and also is in a good state where we can push for renewable energy right now. So first of all, the effects of climate change, I think, are obviously bearing down on us in very visceral ways, right? For example, more it's, it's hotter in a lot of countries, a lot of natural disasters. New York's seeing a lot of heat waves, floods. Um, Australia was literally burning a few like one or two years ago. And also the effects of migration where people are having to move away from these areas that are being flooded and overtaken by the sea. It's very uh, become very clear, therefore, that climate change is a risk to human health and also economic and societal development and growth at the point which is hurting the uh, economic um, production, right? So I think that's why venture capital, uh, venture capital firms are actually interested in investing in green tech right now, right? Number one, they know that people care now that, that their effects are reaching them very closely. Mm -hmm. Number two, they need to take the, uh, the climate change risk into effect in, in when they consider their investment-related decisions, right? That's why even mm -hmm. for self-interested people in the house, in the status quo, it's not just about, uh, the narrative is not just, we need to save the planet, we need to like save all the animals. It's actually, this is having a human capital cost is directly affecting lives, even in like developed cities. That's why we need to act on this now. I think there's uh, the direct economic, financial, and security-related interests and concerns, therefore are able to make uh, investment bankers and also all these people concerned about climate change and therefore want more renewable energy, uh, all the other alternatives in our side of the house. What 
is the, uh, um, the bad thing about their discourse. That's the first offense on why this um, actually hurts discourse about the environmental movement because of the theoretical, theoretical narratives. The first uh, two things I want to analyze here. First of all, we live in a, po a world of like post-securitization, right, where the older generations grew up in a world where, during, through, uh, from like the mid 20th century onwards, nuclear power was said to be the end of the world, right? We had uh, in incredible stigmatization about nuclear power, nuclear proliferation. After the uh, after Hiro uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, we see images of children of people suffering from radiation, and the after effects even now are being stigmatized to a large degree. Right. The second thing is modern accidents, right? Whether it's Chernobyl, more recently Fukushima, even Japan, which is a supposedly a developed country that's supposed to be able to guard against these incidents of like natural disasters and like um, tsunamis, even in recovery, already seems that it's impacted people a lot. Whether it's polluting the nearby sea, a lot of fish, and all the all, all the other animals in that area being affected by the radiation. These are things that make neighboring countries, also other countries that align with Japan, seem to uh, seem uh, have to actually consider the uh, negative effects and ne uh, sustainability effects of nuclear energy in the long run. The impact of this secure, uh, security point, as well as the modern accident point, is that these heavily sensationalized incidents, because each incident of a nuclear accident is incredibly detrimental to not just the environment but the people nearby on a large scale, means that the public reception, therefore the fear of nuclear energy, is incredibly great in status quo, even if it doesn't seem that realistic in a uh, technical scientific point of view. That's why it's going to worsen the fears regarding that. Uh, Regarding, the, uh, regarding nuclear energy, that's why the third impact of this is a public bad public perception of environmental movements, right? Because you have general, general public disapproval at the point at which the images of these accidents are very clear, of that um, war riddled world, war world is very clear. That's why you actually make it so that they're more mistrusting and less um, supportive of what the environment, environmental movement wants. What's the in, uh, also the international implications of this, right? Because there are, many people are su suspicious of authoritarian states that want to develop nuclear energy because uh, the technology is adjacent to like uh, weapons, uh, nuclear weapons related stuff. And that means it's going to raise questions about these, these countries, which overall is going to hint, hurt the impact of environmental movements at the point at which they're pushing for something that actually um, the like other authoritarian states are not trying to push for, but there's international implications about whether it's going to lead to weapons proliferation. That's all bad for, uh, for their discourse. The last thing is local public approval, right? If these things are built in like um, countries, it's going to be built in areas near the sea where there's like uh, maybe tends to be less like um, elites in those areas. That means that the environmental movement uh, is going to be perceived as all again fucking over local people who, in many other countries and the other initiatives, they're the one they're trying, they're the um, unique ones trying to actually save those people from whether it's the deforestation, whether it's from the sea like uh, sea levels rising, right? Also, I think additionally, it cuts against leading sources of energy diversification, uh, diversification right now, right? Like Shell, Exxon Mobil, they're all trying to do natural gas, renewable energy. There's a lot of argument that go goes into it in the starting cost. That's why. I'm on their side of the house, at the point at which you make it so that the, uh, nuclear energy is the main thing, you're actually going to give them, these companies, ammunition to also then attack the environmental movement and also give them less impetus and support to actually be able to do renewable energy sustainably in the future. The next point on sustainability, I think, um, two things. Firstly, obviously mining, mining uranium creates a lot of exploitation in developing countries where the mining is taking place, a lot of people dying, also in unsafe conditions. Secondly, on the nuclear waste disposal, we literally have no solution for it. Governments are just stacking it up one by one. Also, there's a secret that they want to keep locked away, so I think on their side of the house, at the point at which issues come up, that's a secret that governments want to keep quiet. Um, accountability issues, are, I, think, I think, are going to come up a lot longer. They're going to take longer to come up on their side of the house. The last thing that I think right now is that if you want to advocate for it right now heavily, the less you have capital to regulate and push for a sa uh, safety in the future regarding nuclear energy. Why is the case? Because right now you desperately want to convince people that it's safe. I think in the long run, if more concerns and issues come up, you aggregate, uh, you aggravate people's existing fears, you create more mistrust and worry, and therefore there, uh, therefore less funding and less support that makes it actually harder to do more uh, nuclear energy and also um, push for regulations in the future. What do we have on our side going for green tech? I think right now there's a lot of R&D. The potential is much more in terms of like many new forms, not just solar or hydro coming up in the future. Uh, I think the feasibility, on uh, a feasibility standpoint, you'll have, you're able to draw a lot from natural resources as opposed to uh, trying to go into a technology that's very intensive or sensitive as nuclear energy. Our impact is, there, is therefore that you are actually get like higher uh, pickup rates, right? More countries deciding to actually go renewable energy instead of nuclear or anything else. I think also because you, when you, once you actually do all this advocacy, you get more R&D into renewables, I think that means um, that the feasibility improves or about the efficiency and also in the long term we're able to make costs actually go down in a uh, in a uh, re like feasible manner. I think that they don't get that on their side of the house at the point at which they're focusing heavily on nuclear energy. What are the overall impacts that I want to talk about? One incident of one even accident or safety concern over nuclear energy is going to hurt the perception of this movement. That's why all the other things that the environment movement, the movement is working on, like deforestation, biodiversity, overconsumption, that's impacting people right now, but in remote areas far away from the village people, are going to be hurt at the point at which you hurt their movement's perception so much that they can't actually do all the good things that they're doing in the status quo. Proud to oppose. Thank you for
Hold on. tells you the demand for nuclear energy is going down. But it's deeply unclear as to why, because the last time a, a disaster happened at a nuclear power plant was literally decades ago. They have never demonstrated a particular imperative as to why the public is so long-term resistant to this change. And I think I know why. And it's because the answer that the average person is deeply irrational about things they do not know. At the point in which an individual is not told of developments about nuclear power, at the point in which people are left in the dark and kept silent about a technology that actively benefits them, and at the point in which it is actively for the incentives of groups, for example, like solar panel manufacturers, that you undercut things like nuclear because it's better for your own corporate performance, that is the type of thing that means that narratives of lies and fear spread. The reality this team had to confront was the status quo tactics of the environmental movement were not working, countries were not meeting Paris Agreement targets, countries were not improving at a fast enough pace to combat the types of warming that was happening in the world. There was a need for a shift. The only team that provided it to you, and thus the team that will win this debate, is side affirmative. I'm going to do two pieces of response in this speech. Firstly, looking at the response from the public and why the environmental movement is actually able to shift the dial and where's the positive. And secondly, looking at sustainably, integrating a point of substantive throughout. Let's start with the public response, because this team premises all of their argumentation on the idea that the buy-in simply won't happen. At the point we prove that is not true, we run away with the bay, unlock the full set of all of our benefits. And I would note that the actual point at which you need to change public opinion to shift in pol good policy is not everyone. It is simply either the tipping point of groups like venture capital that this team argues for, or a sufficient number of people that it is a feasible environmental alternative that you can add in. What are the four points that they run here? The first thing they suggest is you just can't convince the public that nuclear energy is good. One, I would argue this is based on opinions that are a factual. As we demonstrate, and this thing in fact kind of concedes, uh, the uh, lies that are proliferated about the nuclear industry all the time. The idea that nuclear waste is an unsolved problem is a lie. We have fixed that because of the fact that nuclear power plants are by far one of the longest existing forms of renewable energy technology. They've been around for an extended period of time. They have had far longer research and development than almost any other type of renewable has. That means you should sense check and believe that it is probably far more likely to be both more efficient and better quality than the other renewable alternatives that already exist. The second thing we just say is that part of the reason why this case is because there is no countervailing pushback. There is no meaningful group that is currently supporting things like nuclear energy because of the fact that this public fear just means that movements have defaulted to going towards other things rather than actually challenging these sets of biases. And we prove in our case you can change that. The final thing is just the generation that this team says is so averse to nuclear is aging out. Like the types of people who were raised during things like the Cold War are just older. They comprise far less sets of voters. That means that narratives about why nuclear is good are actually far more persuasive. And also, just way up here, the people listening to the environmental movement care far more about fixing climate change and about avoiding the literal catastrophes that result from that rather than some risk to nuclear that might happen. I think this is deeply unpersuasive argumentation. The second thing they suggest is, oh, well, conversations of venture capital investment shift entirely to nuclear alternatives and nothing else. One, I would point out there is just a sunk cost here, but you've already invested your money into, like, new, into things like solar panels. You're probably going to continue investing in that, because the environmental movement, notably, is not saying solar panels are bad. It is saying that there is another form of technology is good, and that it's probably easy to implement. It should start with that earlier, something this team ignores. Secondly, this argument actually relies on you believing that the environmental movement is powerful enough to persuade venture capital to invest in something they're already doing, and that's really important, because these groups are far harder to convince than the average person, because their profits were already wrapped up in fossil fuels, their profits were already wrapped up in industries that were actively polluting environments, and so, at the point in which you believe from this team that the environmental movement would persuade these groups, it's deeply unclear why they couldn't convince the average person, or at least a sufficient sample size of that, so you could do so. Secondly, I'm going to actually engage this with a piece of substantive, which is just as a say, why prioritizing nuclear advocacy uniquely allows the environmental movement to target fossil fuel companies and mining companies in a way that cannot happen under their side under any comparative. 
Note this is an independent path to victory, because even if you believe we can't change everybody's mind in public, this explains how we push back against companies that make it hard for any renewable legislation to happen, and also increase the probability of them engaging in renewable technologies. Three pieces, or four pieces of characterization. Firstly, fossil fuel profit model is premised on mining, and notably, they all already mine uranium, because all the countries that are uranium rich already export that to an enormous level already. Countries like Australia are incredibly uranium rich, they export that despite the fact it produces no uranium energy itself. Secondly, fossil fuels fight against the environmental movement because of the fact that, one, their profit margins are hard, but two, because they are constantly demonized by the environmental movement, they're constantly told they are the ones creating the problem, that they are the ones who are responsible and at fault, and you are not likely to agree or concede to the demands of the group which constantly villainizes you. Thirdly, it's clearly though that they're not inherently against any climate action. Obviously, things like greenwashing are often pandered, but that suggests that there is no like revealed reason as to why a fossil fuel company will never engage in renewable energy. They simply do so to the extent they, one, care a little bit about public opinion, but two, profitability is clearly the most important thing, which means that we shift the dose incentives, it's really important. The final thing to mention here is obviously these are a huge amount of corporate capture. They and sorry, government capture. They are the reason why on their side no meaningful policies happen in the majority of countries. The point we shift this to make that easy to happen, we win. Four mechanisms then. Firstly, we just provide a direct profitable path for fossil fuel and mining companies to actually decarbonize. Why? One, less capital. They already mine the uranium. The actual treatment and development of plants is often very easy using methods that have already been established and have already been engaged in. It's very much a known endeavor. Countries have used nuclear before as part of their energy grids. The infrastructure is very easy to establish. Two, it directly aligns their existing profit model. They do not want to stop doing things like mining because mining actively is how you make uranium as well. Thirdly, we just explained some more efficient form of energy we should believe has been a technology for a long period of time, which also suggests this is pretty likely. Thirdly, there's just already some investment in it from some of these corporations around the world. We just suggest we get more of it. And finally, this is social signaling. That's to say, at the point in which you say to fossil fuel companies, you actually do have the capacity to engage in something that helps the environment without doing major shifts in what you're already doing. You're actually just far more likely these fossil fuel companies you do convince them to do these kinds of things because clearly brainwashing suggests they have a revealed preference for listening to the public on things that matter, which is why you should believe that at least some of them will engage directly in uranium and kind of other forms of nuclear energy policy. Secondly, it's actually far harder for them to lobby against nuclear energy. One, because it spins narratives against the fact that it's against their profit models. If not marijuana movement literally just gets on and says, this is relatively easy for you to do. So you have to continue lobbying to governments at the point in which that is true. Secondly, we just think this is scalable. We just say at the point some fossil fuel companies engage in this, it makes it harder for others to lobby against it because the narrative has already been set. Thirdly, we just overcome the status quo bias and inaction problem. The problem is currently not that they can't do this, the problem is no one is telling them to. At the point someone tells them to, they're likely to listen. Fourthly, they are just likely to be very receptive. One, because it's far more constructive dialogue than what exists in status quo. Two, because they've demonstrated there is a level at which they care for things like corporate social responsibility, because having consumers be happy in you does directly increase your profit. It means you're far more likely to have public support, you're far less pressure for things like regulation against you. That seems really good. Fine, it's actually just much cheaper than greenwashing. It's often deeply inefficient, it gives you very little direct benefit. Things like engaging uranium are far more profitable. This is four key impacts. One, we shift away from coal more. Two, we get less stuff from lobbying. Three, we lower the barrier for action for these corporations, but notably, we also allow them to long-term plan because we give them a profit model from renewables that allows them to do that shift over time that doesn't happen in the status quo. And notably, if you believe any of our other impacts, this coalesces with them. Two, what quick rise responses under this issue. One, they say this demonizes the environmental movement. One, they don't prove it gets worse, they just prove people already don't particularly like nuclear. But two, it's deeply implausible for the standards of reasons we tell you. That for people who listen to environmental movement, they largely trust that movement, they've already had their mind changed in the past on things like the fact it wasn't a problem in the first place. It's likely it happens again. The last and silliest response they give is all oh, this proliferates weapons. One, the infrastructure for developing nuclear weapons is radically different because weaponizing uranium is very different from treating it as a form of energy. Deeply unclear this would be successful. Finally, quickly engaging with that point on sustainability. One, they say it's bad from environment and previous data. A, we've learned from previous mistakes, that's why we haven't had a nuclear disaster of late. But two, the technology is just better, it's less likely to happen. Also, many of these disasters happen from very easy, obvious mistakes like the mismanagement of the USSR, things you can avoid. Secondly, cuts capital from other forms of nuclear renewable energy. One, we demonstrate this sunk cost. But two, they don't explain why this happens to the point environment is saying to stop doing these things. It is saying, we encourage, as I've already explained to September, a new form of investment that engages with capital that does not already exist. Thirdly, they're like the disposal issue with safety sticks. The last thing they say is there's zero accountability. One, governments and corporations have enormous incentives for this to say, saying so nuclear power plant shuts down, you cannot profit from it, you use a fuck ton of your energy grid, which seems really, really bad. The thing is, this was a far more optimistic policy. It told people there was a solution to the impacts of climate change. That solution exists now. All people needed to do was to vote along the lines of that. That was something that was persuasive to people, which is something that was deeply rhetorically powerful. That's why Affirmative will win this debate. Thank you.
test sets. This team could not compare nuclear energy to the renewable energy technology that existed 20 years ago. They had to compare nuclear energy to the exponential potential of green technology and the real rapid breakthroughs that we are seeing in this industry. They had to make a trade-off of losing funding and support for green technology on their side of the house. The core premise for why they think that green technology is a worse comparative was because of greenwashing. I have three responses to take this comparison out of the debate. The first is that it's unclear this is true, given unprecedented levels of accountability and transparency given today's era and climate of cancel culture. The second is that governments have been able to implement effective regulations to tell the carbon output of these companies to ensure they're not engaging in greenwashing or to only implement renewable energy in a superficial manner. But the simple and last reason is because on, their, on our side of the house, it's not simply the companies that are using and investing in green technology, but also governments as well, the same amount of capital and transparency that they have to implement nuclear technology in government energy frameworks, as it's on our side for governments to invest this in green energy frameworks. Now I want to talk about a few issues. The first is about safety. There are certain structural reasons why nuclear energy is unsafe that is irrespective of the technology of nuclear energy. For example, human error, where someone mismanages the nuclear plant, and for example, natural disasters. So no matter how much academic literature you have about how safe the nuclear reactors are, it does not take into account the risk factor that this might possibly happen. And note, this is something that was severe, because even if the risk was just 1% on our side, we told you that the risk was too high, because it meant permanent damage to land, where the land becomes permanently destroyed and nuclear radiation takes centuries for, to, for it to get out of the land. But secondly, it also hurt the environmental image. It just took one nuclear reactor and one nuclear factory to go bust for people to completely lose trust in nuclear energy forever. And note, the more nuclear reactors they want to build on their side, the more this risk multiplies and it becomes more likely that an eventual blow up happens. But their main response here was that we could educate people and tell people about how safe the nuclear reactors are. We are not trying to convince debaters. We're not trying to convince educated people. We're trying to uh, educate, as I learned from Australians, the ordinary intelligent voter. <laughs> And so here are several reasons why the ordinary intelligent voter would not believe the academic literature. The first is that this is very time consuming and often requires you to pay a lot of attention and read a lot of different scientific reports for you to understand it. So there's no time incentive for you to read up about how safe it is. You're likely going to default to the images of Fukushima and the images of Chernobyl that you're more culturally familiar with. The second is because you need a degree of education or literacy to even understand the safety in the first place. They're likely going to throw a bunch of scientific jargon at individuals and for them to not understand it anyways. But the third is that people in general are anti-experts right now. They feel as if you're condescending to them or you think that they're stupid and therefore they're going to reject any academic literature that you throw at them. But the last thing is that people are very afraid of their lives. Even if they logically understand and conceptually understand that this might be safe, there's still a final part of them that feels this existential terror that something bad might happen in the future. So even if the technology was safe, there are a lot of barriers to get people to actually internalize this in a manner that they're able to fully believe it. But look, even if they could successfully educate individuals, we told you about the paradox, which is that the more you try to tell people it's safe, the more people doubt that it's actually safe. Because why are you spending so much time telling people it's, if it's safe if it's actually something that's incredibly safe? But note, it's not just the fact that there was technological reasons why it was unsafe. We told you about media sensationalism, how the images of Fukushima and Chernobyl are burned into the cultural consciousness of people and people have strong associations with nuclear energy and the radiation and the death of many individuals. They had to break that association. Academic literature was not enough to break the strong cultural association that people have. But note, nuclear proliferation. Their response here was to say, well, the nuclear technology and the nuclear weapons technology are different. That was not our point. Our point was that people think they are the same. So when you start saying that you're going to sell nuclear technology to other developing countries, it creates that fear that these countries might turn their weapons, in, turn their technology into nuclear weapons. And note, they had to accept this because nuclear technology is very advanced and very specialized. And in order for developing countries to have access it, they had to import it from developed countries. There was that political fear that this technology would be turned to weapons on the other side of the house, but also as an additional impact. When you start selling it to developing countries, this is where those countries have weaker legal frameworks, which means that the risk escalates on the other side of the house. Now, given that I've told you why this will be politically unpopular or there will be an incredible amount of political resistance, let's talk about how this hurts the, uh, the environmental movement political image. The first is that the fear of nuclear energy muddies discourse. And over here they said they didn't need to convince everyone. They only need to convince 51% of voters in order for them to pass policy. But note, even if a few people were scared, those people were the vocal minority, which means that they spread contagion fears of this thing eventually becoming a big issue and blowing up and causing radiation and killing all of our children. But also, it only took a few extreme politicians for them to play up the security threat to muddy all of the discourse. So even if they could convince 51% of the people the 
nine percent of the remaining people created an immense amount of political resistance that hurt the environmental movement's image that they are so painstakingly built. The environmental movement right now has good leverage and good social image, which is why many of us try to be sustainable and try to align ourselves with the environmental movement. When they switch that image to support something which many people are fearful of genuinely, I think this is one where we hurt a lot of the momentum that the movement currently has. So first, it the fear of nuclear energy muddies this cause, which means that there's less support for environmental movements. And look, this premise was important because the prerequisite for the environmental movement to have any impact in society was for it to have social and political capital. When politicians don't want to associate with nuclear energy because it's so scary, when individuals don't want to uh, align with the environmental movement because they are afraid for their own lives, this is when the environmental movement loses its basic capital to be influential in society. It loses its ability to have social influence to get people to be sustainable or to consume less or to be more conscientious in the way they act because now people disengage from the environmental movement. But we also told you to which received very little response about how it's likely going to be built in disprivileged areas because those areas are the ones that don't have the political capital to push back against nuclear reactors being built in that area. They did not engage with the impact, which is that this will make the environmental movement seen as an academic elite movement that is deprioritizing those individuals living in vulnerable areas. Again, all of these impacts set up and show that the environmental movement's image is hurt on their side of the house, which means they lose its ability to be relevant. But lastly, it takes a lot of time and energy to provide assurance to the public and investors. So even if they could convince them with academic literature, this took a lot of time and years and years for them to break the cultural association. So note, they tried to win on having a quick solution. The world is about to explode, we need to quickly transition to nuclear energy. The first is that nuclear reactors take many, many years to build. It takes many years for you to integrate it into your infrastructure, as opposed to green energy, which many countries already have the green infrastructure built into their energy grids. But more importantly, it was not so quick, because they had to spend so many years to get the academic and scientific literature, and then spend years to break down the cultural consciousness of people to not be fearful of it in the first place. They could not win on that. But their response here was to say that renewables are unpopular. The first thing is that this is untrue, many, things, many governments are already doing this and many companies are already doing this, so it's unclear it's true that renewables are seen as unreliable. But the second is that if renewables are seen as unreliable, it's easier to convince people that renewable is reliable as compared to trying to convince people that nuclear energy is safe because on our side of the house, all we had to do was to say, look at all of these existing things that companies are already doing and how many countries are already doing this. On their side, they had to break the cultural consciousness and the image of all of the explosions happening there. So, they had to accept the trade-off, which is that funding and attention will be shifted away from green energy and they lose the ability to push for things on other funds. Note, it takes immense amount of capital for them to convince people that nuclear energy was safe and that nuclear energy was something that they should support. When they spent all of that capital on convincing people that nuclear energy was safe, this meant that you had less time for a lot of other things like deep, talking about deforestation, talking about overconsumption, all of these other things that the movement cares about are deprioritized on their side of the house. Now I just want to make a very quick comparison about why nuclear energy is less effective. First of all, Uranium is a finite uh, source and it often exists in developing countries which means that it was something that was depletable on the outside of the house but it never answered the question about nuclear waste which is that a lot of nuclear waste is produced at the point in which you use nuclear energy. The conclusion is this, there are many structural flaws with nuclear energy even if it was a good short term solution it meant that we should envision to renewable energies instead which would be more sustainable in nature. But here's the final weighing I want to do which is that even if nuclear was more effective note that it created complacency because people thought that it was a miracle solution which meant that they didn't have to do anything else for the environment environmental movement or they didn't need to do anything else for global warming because nuclear was here to solve all our problems. Thank you for that Solar had potential, wind had potential, but 
Climate change was burning people's homes to the ground now. It was flooding your cities now. And we had nuclear power in the status quo. That is why we need to prioritise it and stop the backslide to fossil fuels that is what is occurring at the moment. The environmental movement was the only group of people who could do that. Why then did we change people's minds? They tell us that there are concerns over safety and that education is incredibly hard. Note here, the way you should consider this argument is that the environmental movement's number one strongest skill in the world is in persuading people, is in controlling the narrative and engaging in public relations because that is how they operate. They try and get people on side so they vote for governments that have good policy. They get people on side so they change their behaviour in a way that is economically disadvantageous for them in the short term but is long term beneficial. They were a group that were very, very good at persuading people, at educating them. That meant they didn't throw you stacks of academic literature. They gave you conversation starters. They gave you conversations infused with the ideas. The idea that you had to dig through massive amounts of academic literature just fell out of this debate, not only because it wasn't the way that it was going to be done, but also because it's not the way it was done in the past. No one in this room has a clue how solar panels work, but they are still widely seen as incredibly effective as an incredibly good way to go because the environmental movement pushed them as the way to go. They could do this once again. The root of concerns about uranium and about nuclear energy is a degree of apathy worsened by sensationalised media narratives, things the environmental movement was exquisitely placed to push back against. Because the only reason people cared about nuclear energy was because they had been seen in superhero movies to make someone into the Hulk, and because every now and again there's a story that was something pretty awful. That was something that we could push back against with facts and information and education. Because it was not something that was widely taught throughout many high school courses. Because it was something that was just much, much room for education. But note here, we didn't even need to educate that many people. Because once you got the smallest, most die-hard members of the environmental movement on side, they started to tell their friends, they spread the good news, they did it in a way that was very, very good, they did it in a way that was particularly advantageous. Outside of that, they then tell us that this paradox of education means that the more we educate about it, the more people will be suspicious. We're not corporate union busters, we're the environmental movement. Incredibly deeply trusted, seen by people to be particularly trustworthy, seen by people to have really good, high quality incentives, and to be an authority on how they can protect the lives of their children. So when you think about the safety concerns they have, note here that it is the protection of children that the environmental movement does like to push. Particularly there, we are then able to weaponise high profile activists within the environmental movement who are deeply trusted. That is people like Bob Brown, who just saved the Franklin Dam in Tasmania, right? Those sorts of people were people that were trusted and were already engaged in this discourse. At the core of this, people didn't have identities built in opposing nuclear energy. We were able to circumvent that. It is much harder to change someone's opinion when they spend their whole life believing and actively advocating for something in one way, but no one had really done that. They'd seen something off in a far off nation, they'd heard of some disasters that were maybe bad, but they didn't really truly understand the extent and they hadn't built their life and identity around those things. And that meant that a movement which they had built their life and identity around them could persuade them, could change their minds quite genuinely because they did see it as fundamental to their person that they were an environmentalist. So if the environmental movement said we should support nuclear power because we need to fix this problem now, then that is something they should do. Absolutely, we change people's minds. They tell you that safety is particularly bad and they're unable to overcome the emotional component here. Note here, all of the argumentation they run is the standard fear-mongering that is run in the status quo. At the point you believe there is some legitimate response that would persuade you, you all believe that they are well and truly capable of overcoming this fear. But outside of that, there are just a mi- numerous number of ways that we can push back against that, and also just the fact there has not been any significant nuclear disasters in a long time. The rollback and concerns are fear-mongering alone. They are irrational. The environmental movement can weaponise social media, can weaponise TV shows, can weaponise the news media to do all the things they need to do for them. Absolutely. Even if these things are unsafe, even if the environmental movement cannot overcome that, they are absolutely capable of saying that, hey, People are dying because of climate change now. Your home is underwater. Your summers are ruined. Maybe it is worth taking this risk. Maybe it is worth having nuclear power. That was the narrative they could push. That was particularly important, right? Note here the mechs that we gave you to explain specifically how they could change public opinion and how they get very, very limited response throughout this debate. Number one, individuals 
just buy into this movement, they care about it, they eat it up because that is what they believe they should do as an environmentalist. But secondly, people are more than happy to have their minds changed by the environmental movement. They like learning new things, they like being able to have the academic or moral high ground. This gives them a new position so they can contribute to conversation they are engaged in more often. But third, the environmental movement is just very, very good at disseminating information. And that was particularly important because it meant we only had to change a small number of minds who then told their friends and family, who then spread the good word, right? And also this rhetoric was fundamentally optimistic. It was incredibly good. It said, hey, the world is fucked. But we can change that right now, and we can do something to stop that, and we can actually have an actual impact here. Let's then that all that meant is that we changed people's minds, and we were able to get new nuclear energy. That meant that it was worth any capital trade-off because it was engaging in nuclear now that stops the backslides. The way that we were able to actively and rapidly respond to environmentalism, see all the mechs we give you at first. But then specifically on why the capital trade-off is worth it. They tell us we lose access to venture capital. Note here, these sorts of companies have existing incentives to continue investing in other forms of renewable energy. There is already massive support for these things. Continued environmental pushes for these had a very, very minimal change in this debate. What we did get was a significant degree of change on the outside of the house. We turned that a black and outside of that, we had even if you do lose the capital and they do go and invest in nuclear power, that was great because it had such a much bigger and more direct impact on preventing climate change now, which is what we need to do because we built more nuclear reactors, it meant that we weren't building more coal. If we didn't close the reactors down and we weren't backsliding onto natural gas, those sorts of things were massive and important. It tells, uh, they tell us that local disapproval occurs. Obviously, putting nuclear plants in cities is very, very rarely what occurs. They get put out in the desert, they get put out in rural areas where there is just no one around. But outside of that, even if locals are put offside, absolutely worth the trade-off. And beyond that, where the environmental movement engages in this discourse and in this persuasion, it is likely these local communities are not as opposed to these things as they claim because they see the important, they see the support. They tell us that energy diversification means that corporations will push back. This is untrue because there are a significant number of existing nuclear power multinational companies that do massively support the reinvestment and the increased pursuit of nuclear power. That is companies that have the ability to recycle nuclear waste to make power from it again, but are unable to do it in the status quo because of the lack of investment. Those sorts of things were incredibly important. We were absolutely happy to trade for capital, but Absolutely. All, on top of that, we just did not have to do it because there was significant reasons to pursue nuclear power that we told you at first very, very clearly. Outside of that, they bring you a couple of side harms. They tell you that uranium mining is particularly bad. Obviously, they have to mine a bunch of awful stuff out of the earth on both sides of this house. If they wanted batteries and solar, they needed cobalt and lithium, equally bad stuff to mine. But outside of that, they tell us weapon, uranium weapons are really bad. Obviously, there are a range of international agreements that prevent that. And also, these are very, very easy to track and enforce because uranium literally gives off a chemical signal, the radioactive signal, that you can see from space. So when someone is trying to reach uranium, you can just track the way they do it. That is how they do these things in the status quo. But outside of that, these were harms that occurred later. Maybe people were scared about this occurring down the track, but at the moment they cared about their house burning down. At the moment they cared about the fact that summer was going to be 50 degrees for the first time ever, and then they could not go outside anymore. That was the harm. At the end of this debate, there was very, very little trade-off because people already supported all sorts of other renewable energies. And we're happy to make that because we were able to persuade people. We were able to say, hey, nuclear is safe. Nuclear is reliable, it fits within the existing system, it will save your world now. Thank you for that speech, but I'm going to say it's made this weekend. Um, just checking, do I, do I need a mic? No. Yeah. Um, I The problem with that site is that they never engage with the scale of fear that people have about nuclear energy. All they want to do is say campaigns work without explaining why this specific campaign is going to work as opposed to every other campaign that environmental movement has done. I want to start by discussing the public's opinion of fossil fuel of um, nuclear energy. And I want to start by understanding what the stakes are in this issue. Because DPM tries to cop out and say we just need a few. No, it's about the waves of fear and media reporting that we tell you about in Cavern. It's about the idea of how much harm this could cause. Because as politicians, with like imperfect and understanding of what every individual wants, if you just guess that this can be a potential election winner for you, and then you go ham on that, other people are forced into taking a stance and similarly becoming defensive of fossil fuels. Because note, 
any other stunts become seen as gambling with people's lives in the potential immediate future for some random outcome of potential climate change. So that is the comparative on that side of the house. They just need people to find it strategic. It's not about a referendum, it's about public opinion and guessing of public opinion. But finally, note that VC firms tie into this, especially if their mechanism is greenwashing. Greenwashing requires you to get the approval of the environmental movement, in turn requires you to tag on to what the environmental movement wants, and consequently this Opinion, public opinion has a direct effect on all the VC firms and other mechanisms of lobbying that they wanted. So let's go into the core issue in this debate at this point, which is will their education work? And there are a couple of things to say. The first is I want to understand when the environmental movement actually gained traction. Because if it was true that the environmental movement was successful in showing numbers, then presumably they would have gained a significant degree of traction a lot earlier than they did. But instead, when they gained traction is when people felt the most proximate hurt to their lives, Fuck, it's getting hotter. Fuck, it's flooding. Those immediate distinctions and proximities were what changed people's minds. What that suggests to you is that the numbers didn't really work. And the reason for that is numbers and these estimates and projections are ultimately academic in nature or grounded in academics that people don't necessarily understand. And that's why it was the immediate proximate harm that was understandable. The problem for them is that nuclear Armageddon is very understandable to people because it's so inbuilt within our culture. That was the nuance they never dealt with. They specifically said, it's going to be very long term. Look, it has been a long time since something happened. Look, first Fukushima is 10 years ago. Trust the Asian team to need to tell you this. But secondly, note that people associate the long term thing with breaking down with high infrastructure costs of maintenance that they don't trust companies to do, which in turn means that the idea that it's been here for a long time is actually detrimental, which is why Germany had to reverse their nuclear energy already. But third, we told you in Cayman to no response that if they work, if you expand, the likelihood is then that more of these things happen, especially in developing countries where it's less safe. If you have a culture of transparency and report all of these leaks, that increases the fear that people have on that side of the house, which means that the more successful they are, the more they run the risk of all of this momentum being reversed. That is important because it means that effectiveness is not actually going to be sustainable and long term. They say it's about that, that the population is angry or fearful of nuclear power is aging. First, your cohort generation are in your 50s. This is simple mathematics. They have a long way to go and they're the most vocal about this. But second and more pertinently, we live in the last 20 years where the big fear was that Iran or North Korea might develop nuclear weapons. That has renewed these fears in people. They misread us into saying we think that this will cause more countries to have nuclear weapons. We are not the public. We are not like that irrational. But our point is that the public having that fear equally is a problem for that sort of house that they haven't actually dealt with. Then they say, people, it's not, we're not going to use these academic methods in order to teach people. And that's the winner coming from out of the government whip. Look, I think the problem on that side is these are completely different issues. It's very easy for me to prove to you that solar energy works because I can show you yield numbers that show, look, the amount of money and energy is going up and this is having this effect on people. The problem when you are trying to convince people that something is safe is that trying to convince people that something is not going to happen. But there's no statistics for that. There's no statistics that can tell you your X amount of safety because that safety needs something to happen before the statistic works conversely. And people know this, right? The problem is that you're not trying to increase the yield. You're trying to tell them that something will never happen. But never happen is a bar that intellectually you cannot meet. And consequently, that's something that, in, that retains the fear for people. That is why the things that have worked in the past don't work in this particular instance. But more than that, note that people are the least able to con be convinced on things like this, that have fear that directly relates to their lives. Because one, you believe in a culture of being somewhat anti-expert, which is already hurtful, where there's a suggestion that all of these experts and economists are going to fuck around with your lives. Second, but unfortunately, the history of industrial accidents in other sectors affects the extent to which people believe this in this specific area. So ultimately, what this means is that because it just takes one instance to kill you, people have extreme degrees of fear. This also deals with the idea of how you like learning new things. I want to analogize this to the COVID vaccines, where the idea of liking learning new things worked for the anti-vaxxers because it's so much more sensational to tell people that a risk exists rather than tell people that a risk does not exist. The difference is that we don't have previous culture telling us that vaccines are going to all kill us. We have previous culture telling us that nuclear power bombs and explosions are going to all kill us. The analogy here also is to the idea of the war on crime. It is statistically likely that if you are a white person in a privileged neighborhood, crime is never going to get to you. But it doesn't stop people fearing crime like crazy and therefore being very radical in the way they vote. Because again, telling people that a crime is never going to happen to you is a lot less convincing than telling them that a harm will. That significant difference deals with these guys because it proves to you that on that side of the house, they are not likely to be able to tip the scales and convince people that nuclear energy is safe. 
in contrast to many other areas where all you have to do is prove that renewable energy is working and can work. And that goes back to the yields thing I was talking about. Because people understand that the capacity for the corporate sector to increase its productivity and optimize its efficiency is very high. So even if it doesn't work now, it didn't work in the past, not only can numbers continually reject that, People also have a general inclination to believe that technology can get better in terms of the things that are aligned to corporate incentives, but not things that are unaligned to corporate incentives, i.e. safety. That is the difference they never dealt with. I want to talk about fossil fuels since they want to go on about it. What they never responded to was Amy's analysis, which pointed out that this is different because it's non-transferable and factually not what they do in the status quo. So when they have diversified, they didn't diversify into nuclear. Shell and ExxonMobil don't run any nuclear plants, guys. They move into other things like wind and solar energy in the status quo or natural gas. And the reason for this is that it's easier to establish, versus on that side, where the safety risk for them is so high that there's no reason for them to go into it in the status quo. And the more they want to run maintenance, the higher the cost gets, and therefore the less they're going to want this. This is to the fossil fuels. It's also due to the stuff about effectiveness, because the cost is going to go up on that side of the house per unit, the more you are safe on that side. But then they say, just mine uranium so it's transferable. That cut against the PM saying that actually you need very little uranium, which points out that not only is it a different mining industry, it's also directly against the fossil fuel industry's interest, which is why it was more likely, given no response other than this argument, to Amy's material that the fossil fuel industry would oppose this shift. What is the impact? The first impact is it doesn't work. But the second impact is that this is not the impact on the environmental movement. It's not just individual policy. It's the movement as a whole. There's, why the, there's a reason why the most powerful narratives in the US are things like Biden is stupid, AOC is radical, Trump is an idiot. Because it's about personality politics and move, images of the movement that are the most powerful in people's heads. So when you concretize the idea that the movement is going to be very hurtful in terms of the way in which it sees people, that in turn turns people against the whole movement. What does this mean? Well, it hurts other forms of green tech. We've proven that. But second, other areas. Anti-consumption and anti-deforestation. That specifically hurts forests, specifically hurts our ability to have carbon sinks in the world, and where, like, specifically hurts things like ecosystems that keep the world running in ways that we don't understand. If you don't trust the environmental movement to be caring about you, you don't buy into these other narratives that equally, compared to energy, have a direct, proximal, and significant impact on the lives that we live. Toxic waste that kill people far away, but when you're not willing to care about it because you think this environmental movement doesn't have it in for you, and you don't really listen to them. These are all equally problematic issues on that side of the house. The PM's max about effectiveness has fallen out of the debate because to be effective, you need it to happen first, you need it to happen sustainably, all of which you've taken out down the line. That is why we approach. Thank you, image of the environment movement, we told you that right now we have a good amount of support, capital and momentum in status quo, and that pivoting to something controversial like nuclear energy was something that threatened to destabilize the image of the environmental movement. We told you that it only took a vocal minority to be afraid that would muddy discourse with through fear mongering and through threats of a nuclear explosion, and we told you that even if it was the case that people were receptive, it took time to break down that cultural association with Fukushima and Chernobyl. This meant that the transition on their side if it was possible, was something that would happen very slowly and was something that took a lot of political discourse and infighting before they were able to achieve the outcome of being able to transition. The conclusion is, they could not win on urgency because the discourse on their side would take a long time. They could not win on immediately integrating nuclear energy and solving the climate crisis. But more importantly, we told you that people won't feel safe. And over here, they were awfully vague because they said things like people would spread the word and have conversations, but these were not specific enough to dealing with the cultural association of things like Fukushima and Chernobyl. We told you that this was time consuming. We told you that this pertained to complex technology. We told you that people would feel condescended too. We told you people would be suspicious. How should you weigh all of this contribution? The first is that this convincing process was going to be difficult and consumed a lot of attention and energy, which meant that they had to trade off against the environmental movement pushing for other things because all their resources were dedicated to this very arduous project of trying to convince people of something that they were already very sure of. But second is that at best, they only proved under this comparative that some people would be some people will be convinced. And here our burden is lower. Because as long as we prove that there were a significant enough degree of people that were afraid, 
one or two politicians that were afraid. That was enough to activate our harms about how the discourse would be muddied, how the environmental movement's image would be hurt. So therefore, we win on that. At this point, we are ahead because we win the first premise, which is on the image and the momentum of the environmental movement, which was the key condition in this debate for them to have any amount of influence or any amount of ability to affect politics. They lost all of this because they had to engage with this PR project of trying to revamp the image of the nuclear reactors on their side of the house. Their attack on our competitive was built on lies. They said it was an assumption. that They said that everything is greenwashed. They said that people think green energy is unreliable. And they said that we would backslide into coal. All of these things were under-mechanized. I learned in Austro that saying things are unintuitive is a response. So I'll say here. <laughs> Like, it is unintuitive if you look around us now that people think green energy is unreliable. It's unintuitive that there's a backslide to coal. I, I really urge them to pull up one news article that there's someone backsliding to coal right now. So this was deeply unpersuasive and that was the contingent premise. In order for them to justify this transition to nuclear energy, those arguments and those premises had to be true. But here's the way out because I'm Asian and I'm actually going to engage with this, which is that if green energy was unpopular and if it was unreliable, it was infinitely easier for us to convince people of that as opposed to nuclear energy because green energy never had a cultural baggage. So even if those premises were true, we, need, we needed less political capital to convince people that it was safe. We won on that comparative. The last issue I want to tackle here is the issue of, on efficiency of nuclear versus green technology. And they needed a really big win on this one because they lost on all of the other issues. But note, they did not get this win because we told you that there will be nuclear waste which will poison the ground with radiation. We told you that there are risks of natural disasters and human error. We told you that nuclear energy used depletable resources that had to be extracted from the earth. All of this meant that on their side of the house, nuclear energy was not that miracle solution that would save us from the impending doom of climate change. Their nuclear energy was also plagued with certain structural issues that made it inefficient or made it very dangerous. And this is where we win this debate by the largest margin. Because if their side wanted to justify this huge shift, they had to prove that nuclear energy was significantly better than renewable energy. But they did not. It still had all of this baggage that came with it, and this meant that they could not justify the trade-off. Because in order for them to justify the trade-off on the first issue, which is taking all of their time, energy, and taking all of their effort to convince people, they had to prove that it was worth it to transition to nuclear energy. But they did not, because of all these other issues. So, what this, this, does this mean? This means that if nuclear energy was better than renewable, this benefit or this betterness was something that was marginal in nature. And if it was marginal in nature and it was only marginally better than renewable energy because it was, it was played with symmetric problems, then there was no reason for us to invest all this time and energy into it. Thank you for that speech. We now have the final speaker for the round. That time to be the prize. Team loses because they do not argue on the comparative. Because they simultaneously admit there are enormous harms in the status quo that the climate is experiencing, but provide zero roadmap as to how they improve the situation beyond false empirical assertions that everyone supports existing renewables. And they do not engage the plethora of reasons we explain the fossil fuels to uniquely lobby against these kinds of things. They never engage with the reality that nuclear was developed and built up throughout the 2000s at a time where this fear should have existed and should have ever prevented this from happening in the first place. But notably, keep in mind throughout this debate, the comparative of this debate is not the case of forcing an exclusive to shift to nuclear energy versus the continual improvement of renewables on their side. It was an increase in nuclear infrastructure, often funded by new capital that this side never proved they were able to engage, versus a backslide on their side, where, as in a news article I have read, in New York, literally one year ago, a nuclear power plant was shut down, cut down 30% of that city's energy and replaced it entirely with fossil fuels. That is a backslide that's happening on their side. It's one we stop, which is an immediate benefit. But not only we do that, we got far, far more. And that's why we win this debate. I'm going to start with persuasion and talk about whether or not we can persuade people. Because note the problem for this team when they tell you renewables are popular. People don't stop supporting things they already like at the point in which they know those things are good. People were not going to stop buying solar panels on their side. Carbon capture companies were not going to cease to exist on their side, which means they actually have zero positive benefit on this issue. Because even if you believe that almost no one is persuaded by this, if they cannot manifest this in a concrete harm as to what other people do with other types of renewable energy, that is not enough for them to win this debate. Which means, at a point we approve that some people would engage and would believe this, we run away with this debate. 
Their only claim here really is that this would be a huge scale of fear that you cannot overcome, much of the context being pushed for this third. Six ways we are able to overcome this. The first thing is they never engage with this particular way up, which is they require you to believe that historical nuclear events are more scary and more proximate people than to the immediate impacts of climate change that impact every person around the world. The bushfires that happen in your state and burn down the home of your grandmother. The flooding that occurred in your city that led thousands of people to die in countries like Bangladesh. These were the most proximate harms that people experience now. They literally say proximity is important as a form of persuasion. I would argue that relative proximity is far more than anything from nuclear. Secondly, they never explain why nuclear had to be argued exclusively in academic language at the point in which other forms of environmental technology were not. Statistics did exist. They were used as things like solar panels. They never explain a structural reason as to why nuclear can't be argued. Similarly, thirdly, we just say that countries had before, which means there's probably a precedence to convince people that this can to some extent happen again. Fourthly, they never weigh this as relative fear to the overarching aspects of climate change. That's to say, even if you didn't experience a proximate event of climate change, climate change itself was an enormous harm which they can see. And never explain why people's fear of nuclear was higher than fears of warming, of animals dying, or anything like that. Fourthly, and fifthly, it's all contingent on these plants being established poorly, that they're going to be in urban areas, that they're going to be managed poorly. Things which undermine their profitability, but also just unlikely. Like you build nuclear plants, power plants in the middle of nowhere where they're under harms. Which secondly suggests that uh, even, like, it's not actually that dangerous. Meltdowns are often fine at the point you do not pollute things like rivers, at the point which they do not happen right next to cities. Those are easy problems to avoid. It was not very hard to persuade them. If you just move the nuclear power plant where almost no one lives, you will be fine. And notably, this argument relies entirely on the average person as the only group we need to convince. We, though, demonstrate things like venture capital investment of fossil fuels are probably far more likely to find this wretched persuasive because it doesn't attack them, which they never engage with, that it is more aligned with their profit mechanisms, which they suggest it's not a reply, but obviously be comparative here. Something that allows you to still mine, something that allows you to do with things that are already similar to what you're currently doing, was always going to be far more profitable. And that notably, this infrastructure was comparatively much easier stuff for these groups because it was less distinctive than renewables, which meant you did not need total belief in nuclear. The only last claim is the image of the environmental movement drops. But notably, one, if individuals don't like this rhetoric, they probably just disengage. But two, uh, discourse being harmed is not something they ever attach to a concrete harm as to how that affects the world. Maybe discourse is muddy, but I don't see why that's a problem at the point in which that never impacts how renewables develop in the world more briefly. Which means the only harm they have left in this debate is opportunity cost. At the point in which they never explain why investments in things that are already profitable would stop. At the point in which they never explain why it is there is a rollback of things that are currently invested in it's deeply unclear any of these harms manifested. This team did a lot of grandstanding, but the positive material they had was zero, which means any benefit we got on our side was a win, was something that combated climate change, was something that won us this debate.